the 4300 GE. It's currently in the test bench at the moment. And this is a follow up of the quick average power consumption that we had before. And this is going to be a quick review of this CPU. Not as in depth as I normally go, but it's just going to be quick. Because for all intents and purposes, it is the same as the 4300 G. It just has a slightly lower base clock and it's preset to be a TDP of 35 watt, which is a little odd, which I'll get into in a second. The performance is the same as the 4300G in CPU benchmarks and various other things, PC mark and various things like that. It's all about the same. And to quickly follow up on the average power consumption, I did put it all into the same machine in the same power supply as I used before. And it actually clocked in at 52 watt over the course of the hour benchmark. So it is actually drawing slightly less power than what the 4300G is. And the CPU performance, for all intents and purposes, appears to be the same, which is excellent news. So we save about, what, five? watt over the course of an hour so you know that adds up over the year it's not amazing i wouldn't class this a 35 watt tdp cpu though i would say based on what the 4300g does i think 35 watts a bit of a marketing gimmick at this point this is closer to about 45 whereas the 4300g itself is probably closer to around about 55 60. So we're saving about 5, 10 watts in terms of TDP. Which is great, but calling this a 35 watt CPU is a little misleading because at the wall it does draw what it can draw over 70 watts at peak, which you wouldn't expect from let's say what Intel does. Because Intel you probably expect around 40, 50, everything included. This is drawing much more than that. And the performance shows it, so it is a little bit smoke and mirrors. It just has some little things inside to try and manage the heat a little bit more. So you can whack a smaller heat sink on this. It throttles a bit more and that kind of thing. But you could do that with the 4300 G and you get the same results. So what's the point in paying an extra 20, 30 pound for this CPU over the 4300G. Well, it's that lower base clock. It's, it's That's it really. There's no reason to get it. If you're looking for a machine that has the lowest power consumption, this is the chip for you. You can turn off turbo and have it sit at around about 35 watt, which is what I'm gonna try in another video to see if I'm gonna do this passively and see what the performance is like. But realistically, it's a bit of a gimmick. The GE processors recently have been kind of a gimmick. So there's not a massive amount of difference. It really is for if you need that little bit more power saving. But anyway, enough of that. Let's actually look at how this CPU performs overall. As I said, it performs about the same as the 4300G. But I did do that review going on, what, eight months ago now? So let's see how this has fared since. In Cinebench R23, which is a newer version to what I used last time, we're scoring a pretty good score of 5,995. Once again, round about where the i7 7700K is. So that's pretty good. And that pretty much is where this CPU is in terms of performance. So if you've got a Cabby Lake i7 7700K, you about where the CPU is, which is not slow performance by any means. In 3 Mark's new CPU profile, with max threads, it scores 3,155, which isn't a bad score. And in single thread, it scores 702, which is, once again, not bad. This benchmark is a little bit flaky, I would say, at the moment, but it gives you an idea. You can compare against that to give you an idea of performance. In PC Mark, it was about pretty much the same as the 4350G. 
so no surprises there. So perfectly good for a workhorse, which is what this CPU is aimed at. Graphical performance, it's got the exact same iGPU as the G variety of this particular chip. So, so as expected, the graphical performance is about the same. In Time Spy, it's 1,308. In Fire Strike, it's 3,434. In Night Raid, it's 13,954. In Wildlife, it's 7,042. And in Wildlife Extreme, it scores 2,210. And by comparison, this is where it kind of sits between the others. So as you can see, it's around about the same as the 4,350G, which is no shock. Of course, faster than Intel's offering. Haven't tried it against the latest stuff, but from all but from what I can tell, this is still faster. And it's a little bit slower than the GT1030 in benchmarks. In reality, it's around about the same. It depends on if the game you're playing likes fast VRAM or not. Some do, some don't. So you're talking around about the GT1030 in terms of performance, which isn't bad for onboard graphical performance. Now, Final Fantasy benchmarks, I do enjoy using these. In Final Fantasy XV, it scores 2,431. In the new Endwalker benchmark of Final Fantasy XIV, it scores 5,910. And in the old and in the old Shadowbringers benchmark, it scores around about the same at 5,826. So, more than playable actually for this game. I play this on a GT1030, so. It's absolutely fine. You get a bit of lower frame rates in towns, but overall it's perfectly playable. Now moving on to good old Fortnite, because someone's bound to ask. And yeah, you can. It can win Fortnite just fine. This is on medium at 1080p. As you can see, we're only getting about 44 FPS average, which isn't brilliant, but you could lock it down to low or decrease the resolution a little bit and get that smooth 60. But overall, it is playable at this frame rate but you may not think so but there is some room for improvement there because this is just medium at 100 percent there are settings lower than this older games like alien Isol isolation older games like alien isolation perfectly playable we get an average above 60 fps and this is on ultra so older games like that absolutely fine on this which is what you would expect same with something like Tomb Raider, once again, above 60 FPS average, more than Hello? playable on here, though this Hello? is running on normal. Is someone there? And another game I like to test, but for some reason it's not so great now. This is on the lowest setting, I seem to have adjusted some of the graphical settings since I last tested this a couple of months ago. And... I don't know if it was the server or what was going on, but I was having trouble connecting and the frame rate kept dipping down into single digits. We have an average of around about the 30 FPS mark, which is absolutely terrible compared to what I was getting before. Don't know if this is a blip, but Apex Legends, I would not say is playable on this chip at the moment, which is odd because it used to be. Just goes to show that games that are always updating you can't always rely on benchmarks more than they say a couple of months old now i could show some more games i'm not going to you get the idea it's round about the same as what the 4350g does so there's not much point going into every single game possible the performance is good it's round about a gt1030 and if you can get this into a nice small little case as i have shown in previous videos get a nice little small board you can get yourself a very little low power machine that will run cool and quiet most of the time and can play some basic games you can do emulation basic office tasks and some light gaming if you don't mind running some older titles more modern stuff is going to struggle if not completely impossible on this platform which is not a massive issue but if you get a board with a graphics card slot, you could probably put in a low profile, depending on what size case you get, but you can put in there, say, a GT 
1650 or something along those lines and get a very good reasonably powered gaming machine not the best in the world but this is only a four core eight thread cpu of course but all in all it's a wonderful piece of kit so that's all i really wanted to say today thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next one so goodbye